read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance Welcome back to another week of Read Me Romance. Hey, lady listeners. It's this the is last it. week of season eight. Oh season my eight, right? God. Yes, season eight. And this was a tricky season because, you know, we had a, a little half season before this with, I think we had like six or eight books where yeah. we're like, all right, let's just do this until the end of the year. We'll figure out what's next. And then, so this entire season was sort of a compilation of older books that we've played before brand new books and then previews there was a couple of a couple of authors that we had that wanted to show like Kay Brimberg she had like the teaser of her book like the first couple of chapters the season so this season was sort of a mix and mingle so if you're listening now and you want to know what's coming next just we will do a special episode maybe next week or the next where we air it just know that all it's all new brand new audiobooks the entire rest of the season so when do we come from, back are we off for like three august weeks? 1st yeah okay. august 1st is alexa Riley's first and so august 1st we have a brand new never released book that's going to be on the podcast august 1st and from that until january 1st we have a brand new book every week it's a brand new Alexa Riley book. Like it hasn't even been an ebook. No, yeah, never released before. So the day it goes live, it's going to be awesome because it's part of like the Pink Springs series that we did. It's in addition to that. And so we're going to hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll have the print books available then. We'll have our print books back up. So it's the, if you guys remember the tattoo artist, I think he was in the second one. Yeah. It's his story. Mm -hmm. So we had several people ask us about Wes and they were like, oh, are you going to write him a story? And we were just kind of like, oh, no. He kind of just got left out there and we're like, oh, you know, this would be a great podcast book because those are shorter. Mm -hmm. So it's super exciting. But um, yeah, this is our final week and we've got Naima Simone. We're playing one of our old favorites called Grading Curves. I think it's from season one, maybe season two. It's from the beginning for sure. Yeah, and so this was one of our, like, most loved books ever when we were going back and pulling numbers and stuff. We were just like, oh, let's see what are, what's the most listened to and stuff. And people just ate this one up. It's a student-teacher romance, but the woman's the teacher in this. So it's a little bit of a role reversal, but it's just so hot, and she's such a great writer. And writes yeah. just the best of your books. I don't know if you guys what? are in the Read Me Romance group, but somebody was posting pictures in there the other day, and it was like what high school lo- uh, students look like, high school mm-hmm. boy students look like, what they look like in our high school romance books. And they're like, <laughs> oh, I'm like, that's so true. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's so true. Because sometimes I'll do that. I'll, I like a good, uh, sweet high school romance book, but then I'll be like at the store, and I'll see the guy in the letter deck. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, yeah, but that's like yep. an adorable boy cute. Get out of here. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we're, um, we'll play grading curves for you in just a few minutes, but I will tell you if you want to get the ebook now, if you don't want to wait to hear the second installment on Thursday, it's 99 cents and in Kindle Unlimited. So if you want it, you can go grab the ebook now and listen to it all. Um, it's, it's awesome. It says on here, um, it, it's really cute. I, it says, I didn't know him the night I climbed into his chair and under his tattoo machine. I didn't know him when he taught me about the kind of pleasure I'd only read about in kinky millionaire romances. I didn't know that when I walked into my college classroom the next morning, the man who'd inked my skin and dirtied my body would be sitting in front of me. Dean Shaw is my student, my secret, and my downfall if the truth about us comes out. The problem is he's also everything I crave and can't let go. I love it. I love it. It's so good. So, like I said, we'll play the first installment for that in just a few minutes. I'll tell you more about what Naima Simone's got out right now. But um, I'm going to switch things up on you today because I have a lady listener email that sort of pertained to what we're talking about this week or some of the stuff I wanted to talk to you about. Um, This one says, um, the first thing, because I wanted to ask you about book signings. And there was somebody who sent an email today. It says, Dear Lady DJs, uh, the the subject on this is Lady Listener and Facebook Community Group Meetup. I just wanted to say that I absolutely love the podcast and the community of women and writers on the Facebook page, Reading Me Romance Headquarters. 
I honestly feel like so many women in that group all relate to the same things and we all have the same sense of humor. Have you guys thought about hosting an event for the Read Me Romance community? I would honestly pay a ticket price to attend. I just think it would be really cool to be able to hang out with this group in person. I haven't ever attended a romance convention and maybe that's maybe that's that is but just know you have at least one lady listener who would pay to have a community meetup in person happy to wait until more folks are vaccinated because of covid but just something you may want to consider all the best Alyssa. so that was one of my things to ask you about like i see that so many authors are already booking even some for this year for book signings and stuff how do you feel about it i don't know i haven't given it much God, I do know that like when I hear like going to a football game this winter or whatever, I still kind of like clinch up. You think it's like a need, a leftover knee jerk reaction? Yeah, or do you like just think a, you're not ready. I don't know. I don't know. It's PTSD. <laughs> yeah, it's like a little bit of PTSD. I remember when I went to New York, you know, mm-hmm. a month or two ago. I would still like clinch up in places like cool there's yeah. a lot of people and I don't know if it's that I'm scared of getting sick or you're just not used to being around a lot of people yet yeah I think that's a big one too not being not used to being around a lot of people like that anymore yeah you know we went to the drive-in movies um you know our kids were at camp this past week and you know my husband and I we had a date night and we went to the drive-in here which is I'm so happy that they are like thriving this drive-in is you know, because even last year during COVID, they got um, special permission to stay open. Yeah. So they were like the only business in town that was doing anything, you know, and they did concerts and all kinds of stuff. They stayed open later in the season than they normally would have and just to accommodate people and stuff. And they're so busy. And But we went for the first time in a year this past Friday and it was packed. But, I mean, you're still kind of in your own little bubble at the drive-in, too. Like, you're in your car, you're in your own space. But, like, we were sitting in the back of his truck in the chairs, like, on the ta- in the tailgate or whatever. And we were talking through the whole thing. And I was like, we haven't been to the movies in so long. We're those jackasses that are just talking through the whole thing. It's like we forgot that you we're in public. You have to shut up, you yeah. know? But I saw someone that said they went out to dinner uh, for the first time after the pandemic. You know, they went out and had a big fancy dinner and they're like, I didn't realize that I'm used to laying on the couch for three hours immediately after I eat (laughs) in the restaurant and so uncomfortable and all they wanted to do was lay down. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I totally relate to that. So I don't know. So book signings and stuff like I, it makes me I have some FOMO when I see people are getting ready to do it mm-hmm. when I see authors posting they're like oh I'm doing this book signing this one I'm like oh I wish I could do that you know but then I'm like but should we <laughs> you know it's, it's that little part of me that's kind of scared too so, I'm sure it'll um, come slowly and change and get more yeah. used to it yeah yeah I think it'll be too depending on what the reader turnout is you know that's true I would love to do a Read Me Romance event. I think that would just be so fun to have lady listeners in a room together. That would be super fun. It would be super fun. We had a small event one time for Alexa Rally. We did. It was just a a tiny little book signing we did for just Alexa Rally readers and us. And it was so fun. It It felt really intimate. You know, we got to spend, we got to spend like two or three hours just talking to readers and talking about books and meeting people and stuff. But, but. what I liked about it was that it wasn't just like us. Like, I felt like we mm-hmm. got to be with the readers. Like, we mm-hmm. were the readers, too. And we got yeah. to talk with everybody. Like, mm-hmm. we all started calling out different tropes we like and who wrote the best yeah. of the tropes and getting mm-hmm. to participate as a reader. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was really fun because one of the things, like you said, we were... I was like, all right, I have a piece of paper. What tropes are your favorite that you want us to write? Mm Because it was like, tell us what you want to hear. And then when somebody was like, because we hadn't written vampires at that point. Somebody was like, I want to like vampires. And you you were like, hey, you know who writes good vampires? And then it just went on from there. And it sort of became like this really great like book recommendation (laughs) discussion that people were calling out stuff. And that was super fun. 
I love that. So I feel like that's what Read Me Romance headquarters would be. We would all be yelling about like book recommendations and our favorite foods. And, and people would be like, I'm going to tell you this book and you're going to tell me the title because I can't remember. I know. They're like, I, listen, I have a book I need somebody to find for me. <laughs> you know, that could be like um, a game almost. You're like, oh okay, th- this is the book you got to describe for everybody. And they got to get up yep. and got to kind of tell the story and whoever guesses it right first oh, wins. Oh, like get, get surprised. Mm-hmm. Let's do, oh my God, that is genius. Let's do that. <laughs> The other thing I want to ask you about is Britney Spears. Oh, my God. All right. So. I'm so ready for this. I forgot. I, I am, I'm so excited to discuss this. Only because, and I told you the other day, I did not realize how, and you know, I don't think a lot of America realized how bad her situation was. I didn't. Until she, yeah. Until she came out with well, this. Well, here's. I will say this is my thing is I have been very like unsure of the whole Britney thing Mm -hmm. because as a person who's had lapses in my life where I wasn't completely cognate Mm -hmm. or I feel that I was completely in my best frame of thought, Mm -hmm. Britney Spears had gone through way worse than one. And in that time, it's my understanding, this may come out that it's night that she handed over that to her father. It's my understanding that she got with a boyfriend that was drugging her and they couldn't get control of her. All this stuff went under. She went in to get treatment. And that's when she handed this over to her father. So to me, I'm like, that's a very rational thing to do. And then when she came out of it for a while, people had asked her in interviews why she hasn't. And she said, you know, there is no need is what Mm -hmm. she said. She's like, it's fine. I feel good like this, whatever, which Mm -hmm. I can relate to. I would a hundred percent hand over my life to my father without even a Mm -hmm. second thought. Yeah. So here lately, as everybody's seen on Instagram and stuff, she doesn't seem a hundred percent cognizant sometimes with me, but that might be the medicine they have her on that she doesn't want to be on. So Mm -hmm. this whole time when they're doing this free Britney, I'm sitting in this limbo of thought of, well, Mm -hmm. is this the moment of lapse? She was you know, saying that might come? Is yeah, this that yeah. moment? Or is she really need help? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. what's scary to me. I'm mm-hmm. like, I don't know. You know, when we talked about it before, when she was in Vegas and we were like, oh, this is so amazing. Like she has this place and, you know, she has the, whatever they, they call it. I forget the thing in Vegas that they stay there all the time. Uh-huh. You know, she has these shows. She's working so hard. Like, doesn't she look amazing? Like, she's working seven days a week. She's doing all these shows. She must be just feeling amazing, and she loves it. But then you realize, like, Mm -hmm. a week ago, you know, this past week, it was like, oh, no. Like, they threatened to sue her if she didn't do it. She was like, I could literally be sued by my own company if I don't perform all these shows. Yeah. And it was just like, holy fuck. Fuck, you know, and I had no idea. Like you said, I nobody I don't think did, but I sort of thought it was a joke. I thought the whole brief free no, Britney thing was a joke. I didn't think it I, was a joke. Like like I said, I think I told you last I time. Did, I was like, but I had we no had free idea Britney what was shirts happening. like a month or two ago when I started seeing more and more and reading because I don't know why I'm obsessed with celebrity gossip. Mm-hmm. Like, I can spot a celebrity from, like, a hundred yards. And I don't even, probably don't even know their name sometimes. I'm like, that mm-hmm. guy was related to the guy and his mom had an affair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. I knew something wasn't right. But mm-hmm. it's just hard for me to, like you said, watching it all, thinking about it all in your head. But you always have to remember you really, as much as you read, you have no idea what's going on behind closed doors. I know. Ever, I saw this thing with um, Iggy Azalea yesterday where people were like calling her out on Twitter for not saying anything about Britney's thing. They're like, you know, why didn't you say anything? Because they wrote a song together. Iggy Azalea and Britney did a few years ago. And Iggy Azalea had come out when the song came out. It didn't do well. And it was because Britney's people didn't let her promo it. But at the time, nobody knew that. But Iggy came out on Instagram or somewhere and she was like, well, she's like, it's really hard to get a song to be popular when half of the duo doesn't support it. And people called her a hater. And so when they called her out the other day and were like, hey, why aren't you saying anything? And she was like, the last time I tried to say shit about Britney, y'all called me a hater. She was like, I told y'all 
when I did this, when I did this song with her, she was, she said her people had to come to my house and go through my shit to make sure I, she was like, I don't know. There wasn't like passing her drugs or some shit that I was a good influence. And once they like went through my shit, they were like, okay, Brittany can come over and do this now. And they were, somebody else was like, why don't, why don't you say what else happened? And she was like, they made me sign a non-disclosure agreement. And I was like, holy shit. Like, this is what's so fucked up. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's just like, like people knew, some people knew about this, but it's like, what do you say? What you know, you when s- somebody's, yeah. But the, I'm still on that. <sighs> no, this is completely ridiculous. I don't care. That's what makes me not believe the dad or anything anymore because mm-hmm. yeah. Brittany is well enough in her life that if she doesn't want to work, she shouldn't mm-hmm. have to work, crazy or not crazy. Yeah, yeah. You're and to be right. making her do it, okay, now mm-hmm. yeah, I got red flags everywhere. Yeah. Now I'm like, okay, I don't believe you. Because like I said, for me, whenever you look at a situation, you insert yourself into it. So I mm-hmm. feel like I'm looking at it in not the right light because I look mm-hmm. at it with my own father. And I'm like, mm-hmm. no, this father wouldn't be doing – you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So – Oh. It's funny to me because Britney Spears and I are, are the same age. And so, like, I've sort of grown up with her as someone that was the same age as me where I'm like, oh, my God, how the fuck has she done all that? She's the same age as me. Wow, we're both so beautiful for 40. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's easy. But, you know, like, I've sort of looked at her as, like, okay, you know, we're, like, similar in that aspect. Like, I've, like, oh, she's the same age as me. Anyways, and so, um, you know, I think about – in my mid twenties, through my from my mid twenties on to my thirties and my entire thirties, if someone would not let me see my children, thirteen years, that was from that was her entire thirties, her entire thirties and yeah. half of her twenties, you know, like part of that, and I was just like, that would have been from like the, the, my entire marriage. You know, and that's what I can't fathom is like this amount of time that her husband's had full custody of her kids and they've used them as leverage against her. Yeah. You know, and she said the thing about the IUD about, you know, they made her take an IUD and she has no say if it comes out or not. And then you were, we were talking the other day and you were like, she can just, she can't, she take that out like herself. And she, I was like, you would you? Yeah. But I didn't like, think about it like that. When you first said, yeah. kid, would you ever like. What do you mean? I would just reach in there. Like, I I'm thought like, you meant like it, it might hurt. I was like, no. but then you were like, no, to bring a kid into this. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. I was like, can you imagine if she got pregnant with her boyfriend now, what her dad would do to with that baby as leverage? Yeah. What that would be like for her. How miserable that would be to have a baby in the situation where if they don't like her attitude that day, they put her on lithium. Like, what the fuck? What the actual fuck? And what pisses me off more than anything is that, yeah, we're going to do a whole episode on this. But what pisses me off more than anything is that the conservatorship before a few months ago was not run by her $60 million estate was not run by someone in when finance at all. It wasn't run by anybody who had any business experience yeah. in financial investments. That blew my fucking mind. And the fact that her health is not looked out after by a, by a nonpartisan person. You know what I yeah. mean? Like the doctor is on the payroll for the dad. Yeah. So it's just like, there's all these people who are supposed to have, like, I, I told my husband, I was like, how can a doctor just prescribe, how, what kind of doctor would put an IUD in a woman who has no say over her body? And then my husband's like, don't you think the doctor's on the payroll? Like, who wouldn't if you're making that kind of money? Yeah. And I mean, just look like, at oh. all other slubs. Doctors are on the payroll all the time. How do you think yeah. some of these celebrities are getting all these drugs? Yeah. And every one doctor that says no, 10 will say yes. Yep. For enough money. God, I know. It's fucking awful. It's, but then, so, you know, I was like, I don't know. You go back and forth. You're like, well, what if she blows through all of her money? And I'm like, okay, it's her money mm-hmm. to blow through. Yeah, exactly. Yes. That's something I, mean, I, I feel the exact same way. She should be allowed to go on an island and burn her money if she wants to. Leave her the fuck alone. Yeah. But, you know, <sighs> she got with that ex, that ex boyfriend who was drugging her, and that's what started yeah. a bunch of this shit. Yeah. And I'll tell you something. Like I said, I've been reading The Max for a long mm-hmm. time, the celebrity gossip. I don't know if some of you've heard of a site. It's called, it's trashy. It's terrible. It's called The Dirty. 
mm-hmm. where they report on people who are hoes and pay to play. And some of these are normal people. And I'll tell you, when she started dating this man, I was like, I know this motherfucker. I was mm-hmm. like, I know, I know, I know. And it took me a minute to wink him back to the dirty. He's a pay to play from Vegas. What's that? He, you get, you have enough money, he comes play with you. Generally, it's the man's way. A pay to play is a girl's, I'll come play with you if you've got enough money. Oh, wow. So okay. a pay to play is what they call him. Mm-hmm. He was kind of a male version of that out in Vegas, dating all these rich women, just like oh, a gross. girl. So he, Yes, he was on the dirty years and years ago. Because I've been reading that shit since I was, like, in my 20s. <laughs> you can actually go on the dirty and lock it down to your city and go oh, through wow. and find, like, people you knew you grew up with and shit. Damn. Because people write in. And I'm like, learning things on this They tell these today. stupid stories. Some of it could be fake. Some of it could be real. Some mm-hmm. It's just trashy. But he was on there. So I don't trust his ass either. Yeah, no shit. So, maybe oh, he's all in love and it's changed, but I'm just saying, I know he used to roll around on that website. Mm. This her boyfriend now? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, you know what? Maybe she just wants a nice companion and she's paying him for that. And I hope he's nice to her. I hope that she has one bright spot in her life right now. They would make beautiful babies. Oh my God! Yes, Jesus. He's a Christ. handsome man. Yeah, he is. <laughs> but and we'll keep you up to date on uh, live breaking news on the Free Britney movement. <laughs> this is your your local news outlet. Ruby I just Romance. wish. <laughs> I just really hope that the judge steps in and just gets all new people. I need a brand new doctor in here. Mm-hmm. I need a new psychiatrist yeah. in here. I need all of this mm-hmm. evaluated. And yeah, stripped apart, yeah. but just like something is still going on that we don't understand because the judge asked Lori, well, does she want to file? And she's saying, no, I don't want to file. Some There's some other paperwork mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. that's stopping her from progressing forward. She's very clearly scared because she has gone mm-hmm. all these years without saying something mm-hmm. publicly. Yeah. So there yeah, is like, why now? Why I still feel way? like there is a piece we don't know about. That's being mm-hmm. used or leveraged against her because her lawyer, I would have thought, would have gone ahead and pushed forward. But he said, no, at mm-hmm. this time, Brittany doesn't want to move forward. It's like, mm-hmm. I don't know. What do you want then? Yeah. I mean, what's going on? Mm-hmm. So. Like I said, we'll keep you guys updated and you can, um, you know, send us an email. What are your thoughts? <laughs> send it to readmeromance at gmail.com. You know, I always say, like, we don't know what's going on behind closed mm-hmm. doors. I don't know if I've ever said this before on here before if we've talked about it. I mm-hmm. remember growing up, I had a really close friend, and she was with another one of my really close friends or family, whatever. Mm-hmm. And we used to go out, and she would say, he is this way. And we would be like, I don't know what you're talking about. When he drinks, he's not that way. He's always been nice. He's always been great. I don't know. Everybody's like, why? We just thought she was being like, you know, snooty about it or didn't want him drinking too much. And she's like, we always thought he was fun. And then I remember yeah. one night I went to this girl's house and I spent the night because I got in a fight with my husband. Mm-hmm. Go over there, I spend the night. In the middle of the night, I wake up at three in the morning and this man is going fucking psycho. Really? In the middle of the night banging on the door and I remember setting up in bed and she's like holding the door closed and she's like this is what I was fucking talking about holy shit and I remember sitting there and I was like so this is what people are talking about when they said you don't know what's going on behind closed people's closed doors that was my epiphany moment of like okay I've known these people like my whole life and I did not know that so it's very much that you really don't know until Mm-hmm. And the fact, like, how brave of her to go and air her dirty laundry, because you know, she knew that as soon as she said all that shit, she knew that was going to be all the talk, you know? I'm in the fear of what they're going to do now to her. Yeah, yeah. How much courage that took for her to do that. I just hope now that there's eyes on her because of this, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Everybody's oh, gonna Brittany, start digging in. You. Yeah, all these people are gonna start digging in these doctors' lives, mm-hmm. these nurses' lives, mm-hmm. and oh, I saw something on Instagram, and it was Us Weekly that had posted up the Free Britney thing, and somebody just pulled up all their old covers with Britney, just where they tore her apart, 
And they're like, you're part of the problem. Yeah. You don't get to come in here and say free Britney now. You're the ones that help incite this bullshit. And it's like, Britney gone crazy. Britney not fit to be a mom. Blah, blah, blah. Like all these like terrible covers where they had participated in it. And it was just like. Yeah, they've been going after yeah. people. They were like telling Justin Timberlake to set the fuck down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I did like that Paris Hilton, you know, really reached out to her. I like. I thought that because she had mentioned in her statement, she had mentioned the Paris Hilton documentary. She said, "I didn't believe Paris until I watched that," and she said, "And that made me brave." seeing what Paris had gone through and how she had told her story about Paris Hilton, the abuse that she had uh, endured at this private school that Paris never told her family about because she said that the teachers there threatened her. Like everybody there said, we'll just say you're lying. Your parents won't believe you, you know, and she was just locked in this hell. And Brittany said she watched that documentary and it made her brave enough to do this. And I love that. Like, Paris's mom and like Nikki and all them like reached out to her and I thought that was really sweet. So. You know, off kind of topic is um, Kathy Hilton went on the Housewives now. I saw that in the article. It said she was a housewife. And I'm like, how is Mel not? And I'll tell this? you something. This woman is amazing. Even on Twitter, everybody's like, really? protect Kathy Hilton. Really? She, she is the most so down good. to earth. She has that. She doesn't even realize she slays. And she's, really? oh my God, she is comedic. Oh, Me and my friends this. are talking about it that watch and I'm like, she's like the funniest housewife we've ever had. She doesn't even know <laughs> it. Like in one episode, she's, Kathy or her sister's trying to sleep and she's like, what are you doing over there? She's like, I'm drinking this drink. And she rolls over and she's like, that's a Red Bull. And she's like, I just <laughs> thought it was a spirit. <laughs> <laughs> she seems sweet. She's hilarious. Yeah. I like her a lot. I like that. Let's talk a little about Naima before we get into the first installment of Grading Curves. Um, I'll read your book bio for those of you who are not familiar. She is published in, since 2009, USA Today bestselling author. Naima Simone loves writing sizzling romances with heart, a touch of humor, and snark. Her books have been featured in the Washington Post and Entertainment Weekly and described as balancing crackling electric love scenes with exquisitely rendered characters caught in emotional turmoil. She's the wife of Superman, or his non-Kryptonian, less bulletproof equivalent, and mother of the most awesome kids ever. They all live in perfect, sometimes domestically challenged bliss in the southern United States. I love it. Her website is Naima, N-A-I-M-A, Simone, S-I-M-O-N-E, dot com. And on her website, I love that it says, don't worry, it's a lot cleaner than my real home because there's not all that, oh, I want to eat, mom, and I need clothes to wear. Can you do laundry? So yeah, I love it here. Come on in, put your feet up, hang out, and poke your nose in my stuff. I don't have underwear drawers here for you to snoop through, but I do have books. Way more fun and interesting than the granny panties anyway. It's LOL. Enjoy. That's <laughs> like they're at the top of her website. It kills me. I, I love, love it. it. So her most recent release is Broody Brit, and that cover was so hot. We actually did some promo for it last week. It's two ninety nine right now, or it's in Kindle Unlimited. Um, it's it's super hot. And it has oh, an actually, audio as well. Yes, it is. And then um, I think it's the Road to Rose Bend. I can't remember. That was the other one she had out before this one, and that was the one where it's not like a second chance romance, but the girl is pregnant when she comes to this new small town, and she falls for the sheriff there, and so he falls for her while she's pregnant. He's actually a widower, and so the cover is like actually really beautiful. It looks like a uh Thomas Kincaid print but like the book is like really twisted and dark and dirty and she even said she was like the cover does not match the story <laughs> like but it was a it was like a traditional publisher so they wanted something that mm -hmm. was like oh we can put this on the shelves everywhere and it was like reading it I was like oh shit Naima what the fuck did you do <laughs> like not expecting it so that one's an audio too I have that one yeah we're gonna play the first installment of Grading Curves and We'll talk more on the other side. Right. See you there. Bye. Bye. Chapter one. Nikki. It's a tattoo shop. Not the hellmouth or the bog of eternal stench. Or a buy one get one sale at Forever 21. Not that I actually shop at Forever 21 because, one, I left that age behind nine years ago. 
and two, I left the ass needed to fit into those clothes about 15 years ago and four dress sizes ago. Still, with two nieces, I know from personal experience, a sale there is a special kind of torture. And 90s TV shows, 80s movies, and skinny girl shopping habits aside, I'm stalling. Woman, get your ass in there, I mutter to myself. Inhaling a deep breath, I grab the handle on the front door to the tattoo shop and yank it open. Bells jingle above the doorway, loud enough to be heard over the rap music blasting from the speakers. All heads turn my way. All two of them. A tall, bearded man whose wide shoulders are testing the limits of his white t-shirt. And a young, gorgeous woman, almost as tall as the guy, with half her head shaved and the rest of the thick, long mass flowing over one shoulder. Both are covered in tattoos. I swallow, and the voice in my head that sounds suspiciously close to my mother's screams, Bitch, you crazy? Without my permission, my feet take a step back toward the door, and the safe, boring world I'd meticulously planned for myself, which directly contradicts me being up here in a tattoo shop ready to permanently mark my body in places that might not be as tight and elastic in 10 years. For some people, This probably isn't their definition of wild, but for me, with my fear of needles, it's the equivalent of streaking through Kensington Palace brandishing a Harry Marry Me poster. I might have a thing for the red-headed royal. You lost? Lumberjack asks. He shoves off the front desk that he was leaning on and moves toward me. If you're looking for the cafe that was here, it moved to the other side of town over a year ago. Okay. I know what he's seeing. Older black woman, older than him anyway. Simple, almost conservative clothing and jewelry. So I get his question. Doesn't mean I'm still not offended. But with terror crawling through my veins like an army of ants headed to Armageddon, my throat is too dry to deliver a verbal smackdown. No, I blurt before he can give me instructions to said cafe while ushering me out of the shop. He halts, frowning at my most likely too loud and vehement protest. I mean, no. I'm here for a tattoo. Please. I tack on since he and the supermodel only stare at me more. Where? Beneath the cardigan? He nods toward my pale blue sweater that's opened over a white tank top. Okay, that was just snippy and uncalled for. My cardigan was cute as hell and 50% off at New York and Company. Forget him. The supermodel interjects with a wave in his direction. I'm sorry, but we're about to close. Can you come back tomorrow? Or if you know what artist you'd like, we can set up an appoint... I can take her. A new voice. A dark rumble of a voice like a smooth scotch on extra hard rocks enters the conversation, and the three of us turn in the direction of it. Relief flows through me that my mission hasn't met an untimely end. Thank you, I... I think I'm hallucinating, because no way on God's green earth can you exist outside of an LSD-induced vision and sons of anarchy reruns. Jesus. This new man staring at me from behind the desk is almost hard to look at because my mother insisted we all attend church on Easter Sunday and Mother's Day if no other days of the year. I know the story of Moses having to hide himself from gazing directly at God's glory or else be killed. That's the dilemma I find myself facing. I never thought dying from lack of oxygen to the brain due to deadly hotness was a thing, but apparently my bachelor's and master's and the Bible didn't cover everything. Dark, almost black hair shaved close on the sides and longish on the top is slicked back from a face that is a little too sharp, a little too mean, and way too beautiful. His cheekbones, nose, and jaw are made up of cutting angles, edging just shy of harsh. Not even the half-past five o'clock shadow covering his jaw can hide its marble-hewn lines. As if apologizing for the severity of his bone structure, 
His mouth is a creation of soft lushness. And his eyes? Blazing blue like the heart of the hottest flame. This is upstate New York in September, but his skin holds a golden tan that probably has more to do with genetics than a bed under ultraviolet lamps. If a lumberjack is wide and huge like, well, a lumberjack, then this man, equally as tall, if not beating him by a couple of inches with almost the same shoulder span, is cut like a swimmer. No, my eyes jerk back to his bright, unwavering gaze. A wolf, a lean, menacing, but gorgeous wolf whose pelt you want to dig your fingers in and rub your face all over and run away from at the same time. And the tattoos. Good God, they swirl over almost every inch of him. His neck, his strong corded forearms that aren't hidden by a black Henley, his hands, and if I'm not mistaken, even one side of his shaved head under the short hair almost hiding it. I can take her. His words ricochet against the walls of my skull, and suddenly they sound so much more salacious, dirty, like a filthy promise instead of a kind offer. I should feel all shades of shame for even considering the softness of his mouth or if he offers filthy promises or not. Even with the scruff, the large frame, and piercing stare, he's young, too young for me to have these kinds of thoughts about him anyway. Yet, my mind persists in wondering how those big inked hands will look against my bare, unblemished skin. He arches a dark eyebrow, and a low snort from Lumberjack yanks me out of my plunge into that community pool of lust. Fuck. Where's the lifeguard to drag your ass out when you need one? I clear my throat and act like I wasn't just standing there ogling him like the last forkful of banana pudding. Yes, thank you. I don't want to put you out, but if you could fit me in, I would appreciate it. He nods, then almost dismissing me, he turns to the supermodel. Take her info and I'll go get set up. Sure thing. The other woman smiles at me and motions me over. You're in luck. Dean's usually booked months in advance and rarely takes walk-ins. He's one of the best artists in the shop. I'm standing right here. Lumberjack rumbles as I stride past him to the desk. She rolls her eyes, taking my license as I read the consent and release disclosure and sign it. Seconds later, she takes the form, makes a copy of it, and hands it back. Your name's Nikki? Mine too. She smiles and stretches her hand out to me. Nicole Miller, nice to meet you, Nikki Barber. You too, I return, shaking her hand. I don't bother to correct her about having the same name. Everyone assumes mine is short for Nicole, but it isn't. My legal name is Nikki because my mother loved the song Darling Nikki by Prince. Yep, she named me after a sex fiend masturbating in a hotel lobby. If that doesn't sum up the nature of our relationship, I don't know what does. Let me show you back. She strides from behind the desk and I follow her past a wall into a corridor. She turns left into a wide open layout bisected by cubicles. There's six of them and she leads me to the one at the far end of the room, pausing at the one on the left. Here you go. Good luck with your tattoo. She sticks her head around the corner of the opening. Unless you need anything else. I'm out of here, Dean. You're good. I'll lock up after we're finished. He appears in the entrance, giving Nicole a one-armed hug. Again, nice meeting you, Nikki. With that, she takes off, leaving me alone with... Dean, is it? I move forward, the short distance still separating us. I guess I'd better get comfortable being near him. Very shortly, he's going to have his hands on my body. Heat licks at my belly and I fight not to squirm, but my gaze still drops to the aforementioned hands, big like the rest of him, with long, elegant fingers and artist fingers. They look like they could be gentle, soothing, and then demanding, rough. My sex clenches at the thought of experiencing both, because something tells me 
he would be a master at either soft or hard, cajoling and commanding, sweet and raw. Dragging in a breath, I return my attention to his face and find myself locked in a visual showdown that ratchets the furnace inside of me from contained campfire level to Nero playing on his fiddle let the shit burn level. Unable to meet that intense blue gaze anymore, I duck my head like a coward and pretend that folding the disclaimer and shoving it in my purse is the most important task of the night. But Jesus, if I'm this turned on by just the sight of him, what the hell am I going to do when he actually touches me? Maybe the needle on the tattoo machine will switch off this. Oh, fuck. The needle. A question. I cough, squinting up at him. Uh, just how bad is this going to hurt? I might have a tiny pair of needles. And by tiny, I mean the nurses having to bring in the straps and cuffs to vaccinate me when I was a kid. On the scale of 1 to 10, 1 being nothing to see here and 10 being knock me out to get it done. He crosses his thick arms over his chest. Don't you look, damn it. Don't look at those tendons and muscles flexing under all that inked skin. Are you a virgin? I blink. Blink again. Um, excuse me? I don't see what my sex life has to do with getting a tattoo. A tattoo virgin. He clarifies, his eyebrows arching. I'm guessing you've never had a tattoo before. Warmth that has zero to do with his hotness prickles my skin and races up my throat and pours into my cheeks. Right, I say, pushing a hand through my curls. I should have guessed that. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Because of the needles. He nods, studying me with a scrutiny that seems to peer beneath flesh and bone to every secret wish and need, locked up tight from prying eyes and unworthy people. Come on in. Nikki, right? Yes. I follow him into this surprisingly spacious cubicle. I've worked in enough of them when I put myself through college to notice that someone actually put care into the design of it. The walls stand at least six feet, and though he towers over the top by a few more inches, it's the perfect height to provide privacy for most people. A rod stretches over the opening, and a black curtain is swept to the side to ensure even more concealment if needed. There's a small table with a computer monitor, keyboard, and printer set up in a corner, a drafting board like architects use, and a red steel large piece of furniture that resembles a dresser with its drawers and flat tops. The rest of the space is taken up by what looks like a barber's chair and several pieces of folded up furniture against the walls. It's neat and would almost be sterile if not for the framed art lining the walls drawings, and even a couple of photographs of vivid Chinese dragons and koi fish, flowers, ships crashing onto rocks, even a mural of the X-Men that appears to be inked onto someone's back. Interesting choice. They're all beautiful, exquisite, even. And though I can't explain how I know, I'd bet the last $20 that my mother left in my checking account that they are all his. I have a seat. He waves toward the chair and drags over a stool facing me. With his height, our knees are on the same level, almost bumping. To answer your question, it depends on the person and their pain level. Most people find it tolerable and nothing to cry over. Some even find it pleasurable. My face must reflect the, what the fuck, reverberating in my head because he shrugs a wide shoulder. Like I said, it depends on the person. Also, where are you thinking of getting it? Some areas are more sensitive than others. I wanted it low on my left shoulder. I twisted to pat the area, giving him a more accurate idea of the location. That shouldn't be too bad. Now, he leans forward, propping his elbows on his thighs and bringing him a little closer to me. Are you going to go through with this? Or... Do you chunk it up to having a wild idea and walking away? I frown, a little offended. 
what makes you think I'm having a wild idea? Well, I am, but I've thought about it, made up my mind about it. He scans my cardigan, tank, and jeans, and without words accuses me of being, what, too old, too pathetic, too weak. I'm projecting on that last one, but the knowledge doesn't stop the anger from simmering inside my chest. What? Are you trying to tell me that women my age don't come in for tattoos? I snap. Nothing to do with age, he murmurs. I don't know how old you are, since I didn't look at your license. But women of all ages come in here. That's not what I meant. When you busted up in here, you look like you were forcing yourself to. That any minute... You could just as easily turn around, walk out, and not come back. That doesn't say certainty about what you want. Maybe pride or stubbornness is putting you in this chair, rather than a desire for a tattoo. And that's not reason to be here, permanently modifying your body. Had I thought he was too young? He can't be more than 24, six years my junior. But he possesses an insightfulness that was amazing. And unsettling. He needs to be a young, hot artist who makes my body tingle in places that have lain dormant for so long, they're probably atrophied. I don't need for him to make me curious. Curiosity is a slippery slope that leads to a longing to discover more about him. When I leave here, I'll never see him again. We'll forget him. Curiosity would prevent that. I'm sure, I say. Voice flat and brooking no argument. At least that's how it works with my students. And though he arches an eyebrow, he doesn't argue. Relief flows through me. Do you interrogate all of your clients like this? No. Only the ones wearing baby blue sweaters. Diamond earrings her man probably spent a mortgage payment on. Has gorgeous curls and a fear of needles. I stare at him. Maybe gape. Did he... Did he just call me spoiled and complimented my hair in the same sentence? He can't be flirting with me. Tatted bad boys don't go for older, boring college professors. And everything about him screams bad for me. Usually, I go for men like Dr. Chris Russell, who I met at the faculty mixer days ago. Older than me, job that involves numbers or books, wears khakis or dark slacks, button-down shirts with bow ties, has a 401k, and is definitely ink-free. Adrenaline over the tattoo must be having my imagination working overtime. Okay, do you have any idea what you want? He asks, that firm voice all business again. Business-like or not, that's a loaded question if I ever heard one. Yes, a woodpecker. A woodpecker. He repeats slower, like Woody. I frown. Well, I guess, but less cartoony and mean. He studies me with that unnerving, all too seeing gaze for several long moments before he rolls the stool over to the computer and the drafting table. The next 20 minutes are spent in silence as he works over his tablet. Finally, he finishes and crosses over to me in three long strides. Is this something like what you wanted? He hands me the thin tablet and I stare down at the screen. No, it's not what I envisioned. It's better. My heart pounds in my chest. From the bright red crest to the black and white streaked head and flecks of red near the beak onto the black and brown molted body and feet. The drawing is gorgeous. Even the bark of the tree it clings to is so lifelike. I lift a hand to touch it before I can stop myself. I'm half expecting to feel the rough knobby texture and the silken feathers and fragile bones of the bird. Odd, I raise my gaze to his. It's beautiful, I breathe. Tears sting my eyes and I duck my head, batting my lashes to hold the betraying silly moisture back. I love it. Thank you. You're welcome, he says softly, almost gently. And I stiffen because surely I imagined the brush of fingers over my hair. Yes, it was most likely the air from the AC system. 
I'll get this printed and have it on you. Take off your sweater, and you'll probably need to lower your strap and push the top down a little. My belly executes a nervous stop, drop, and roll. He doesn't wait for my agreement, but turns away toward the scanner and printer. I just stare at his back, speechless. Stripping in front of him, even if it is just my sweater and a strap, I swallow, trying to moisten my suddenly parched mouth and throat. My pulse dances at my neck and wrist, and my skin prickles as if every follicle and cell is standing at attention, impatiently waiting for the instant when his big artist hands touch me. Is this a good size? He turns back to me with the transfer paper and pauses, frowns. What's wrong? You okay? Yes, I'm fine. I hurriedly remove my sweater and shrug out of the left strap. And that size is perfect. To avoid his scrutiny, I twist in the chair, presenting my shoulder and back to him. Water hits my back and then he's touching me. I shiver, and no way he could have missed it. Please, God, let him chalk it up to being cold. Look who my mother is. I think you kind of owe me one. I don't know if my prayer is heard, but Dean doesn't comment on the full-body quake I just gave, so I'll take it. Because for the love of all that's Hail Mary worthy, he's just smoothed his palm over me, and my sex clenches so hard, I'll probably be bruised down there. I hold my cardigan up over my breast. If he catches sight of the beaded nipples that are no doubt protruding through my bra and shirt like spikes, my humiliation would be complete. Fuck humiliation, my nipples yell. We want some of that. Oh, for fuck's sake. Slowly, he peels the transparent from my skin. And even that's a sensory caress. Take a look in the mirror over there. Careful to keep a grip on my sweater, I shove off the elevated chair and cross to the mirror hanging on the far wall. Turning, I inspect the outline on my lower shoulder blade and upper back. It's medium-sized, but if I needed to cover it for work, I wouldn't have any problems. Perfect. I return to the chair, but he's lugging one of the folded-up pieces of furniture over, and in minutes, he has it erected to form a long black cushion table-slash-bed-slash-OBGYN chair. I refuse to think of stirrups. Come on over here. He pats the cushion. When I eye it, not even attempting to hide my skepticism, the corner of his mouth quirks. The first smile I've seen on him, even if it's a not-quite smile, and I quickly glance away from it. If his lips look full before, that slight curl made them positively edible. Trust me, I've had a 400-pound biker whose beard added another 15 stretched out on this. It can support your tiny frame. Tiny? I snort. When you're 6'3 or 6'4, I suppose my 5 feet 4 inches may seem small, but with my full C cup, hips for days, ass and thick thighs, I've never been called petite or tiny. I need you to lie on your stomach. I got you. Dean murmurs, cupping my hips and helping me to turn and shift so I'm positioned as he needs me. With a professionalism that isn't lost on me and is much appreciated, he gently tugs down the back of my tank top until more of my back is exposed to him. I must be flashing him a fair amount of side boob, but to give him credit, he doesn't seem to notice, and I can't decide if I'm relieved or disappointed over that. He spins around to his station to gather ink and small caps, but my skin is branded by his palm prints. Part of me wants to reach down and scrub at my hips, try to erase the phantom pressure of him cradling me. But the other, needier, darker part hungers to cover it, press it harder, deeper into my skin. Savor that branding for as long as I can. Ready. He rumbles from beside me. My nerves are tap dancing like they're auditioning for Gregory Hines. The buzz from the tattoo machine fills my ears. And I tense. But Dean doesn't make me wait, 
doesn't allow my fear of the unknown to escalate until I'm paralyzed, settling one hand on the middle of my back. He bends over me and puts the needle to my skin. In pure reflex, I flinch, but he murmurs, easy, and doesn't stop with the first line, which is good. His calm clears the voice inside my head, screaming, needle, abort, abort, and I concentrate on what he's doing to me. It's not painful. And if I didn't know those instruments of torture were what transferred and embedded the ink into my skin, I would have assumed it was a really sharp pen dragging across my skin. That's what it feels like. It's a steady, grating sting, but nothing unbearable. I exhale the breath I hadn't been aware of holding and slowly relax. Okay, this isn't too bad. You good? He asks pausing to lean over and study my face. I nod, and he returns to my back. This time, when the buzzing starts, I don't jump, and my body doesn't turn into a slab of marble. And Woody wasn't mean. He just didn't take anyone's shit. Remember that episode where he went to the bougie as hell restaurant, and the major D refused to serve him because he wasn't anybody important? Woody refused to take that line down. So he dressed up as some princess and damn near broke them, eating them out of their food. He did tear up the restaurant at the end, though. He snorted while I marveled at his random and startling knowledge about cartoons. See, there's a difference between fucking someone over and doling out what they have coming to them. I don't reply, but his last words strike a place so deep inside me. I vibrate with it. There's a difference between fucking someone over and doling out what they have coming to them. How he encapsulates my life in that simple sentence. So, why the woodpecker? He presses. Initially, I remain silent. My reasons are my own, and not ones I want to share. Especially since they have to do with my mother and family. With my own cowardice. But as if he's a bartender and the tattoo gun is a shot of scotch, my lips part of their own accord and I'm confessing. One morning, a few weeks ago, I should have been at work, but I couldn't drag myself out of my bed. I stared at the far wall, much like I did that morning when all I wanted to do was curl up beneath the covers and never emerge from them. I was in a dark place. Then I noticed this constant, insistent knocking. At first, I thought maybe someone was at the door, but it was coming from the side of the house near my bedroom window. A woodpecker. It continued for at least a half hour, unrelenting, as if it were telling me to wake the fuck up, to get my ass out of the bed and get on with the business of living. I laugh. And it's small and self-deprecating. Because hell, I know how I sound. But Dean doesn't take the opportunity to join in and tease me. Instead, he straightens on the stool, shuts the machine down, and stares at me. There's no condemnation in those beautiful eyes. No, his gaze holds nothing but understanding. I shift my attention back to the wall not ready to see that, not sure if I even want it. Anyway, I did get my ass out of the bed, and I accepted a job offer out here that I'd applied for on a whim. Then, I packed up and moved hours away to start over, but not before I turned my mother in to the police for identity theft. That information I managed to keep to myself. And then, you walked in here for a tattoo to commemorate it, he says. That's some ballsy shit, Woody. I blink, then snicker at the nickname. He means it as a compliment, and I take it that way. With a slight smile curling the corner of his mouth, he returns to his work. For the next few minutes, silence reigns as I run over our conversation since that I'll take her through my head.
I bought them myself, I murmur, the words escaping me without my permission. He glances up at me, lifting the gun from my skin. Blunt. The earrings. I unfold an arm from under my head and tap one of the diamond studs. A man didn't buy them for me. I did, as a present to myself after I graduated college. Why it was important for him to know that, I can't say, which seems to be the theme of the night. Not that you need one to give you gifts. And I think it's badass and sexy as fuck that you can do it for yourself. But you don't have a man to do that for you? Badass? Sexy as fuck? Okay, there's no mistake in that compliment. And even though it's most likely the kind of throwaway thing a man his age, who looks like him, casually tosses out to women, my heart thuds against my chest like an anvil striking steel, and it echoes in my sex, my clit. Desire slides through my veins, heavy and thick, like the sweetest, warmest molasses. I fight the urge to squirm, to both increase and alleviate the swelling between my legs, created by just that piercing gaze and his words. No, I say, shocked at how even my voice is but so damn happy. How humiliating would it be if he realized this woman old enough to have babies at him was having hot flashes over him? Well, not right now. What the fuck's wrong with the men where you lived? Or are they blind and dickless? I wait for him to return to the tattoo before softly saying, not all of them are bad. Yes. I dated a few assholes, but there'd been a couple who'd been good men. I hadn't blamed them for calling it quits when they couldn't put up with my family constantly hitting them up for money or stealing it when they didn't agree. How would Dean handle them? My mother? He might be young, but somehow I can't see him standing for their behavior. We both fall silent and the lull of the buzzing tattoo machine and the constant drag of it over my skin draws me into the subspace where only my body, his hands, and the beasting pain exist. Closing my eyes, I fall under the seduction of it, craving the slight strokes and tugs on my back, the pain that's riding the edge of pleasure. A low but aching throb sets up shop at my lower stomach, and farther down still, in my sex. My breasts grow heavier, and lying on them, the nipples taut and sensitive against the black padding intensifies the pressure, and my teeth sink into my bottom lip. Keep still, Dean murmurs, wiping a paper towel across my skin, only a little longer. I nod, but, God. My body has turned into one big tuning fork, and he is the sole frequency I'm attuned to. I struggle not to quiver, to shake with the need zipping through me like tiny electrical currents. He'd warned me about some people deriving pleasure from getting tattooed, and I hadn't believed him. Now, I do. Yet it's not the pleasure slash pain of the needle or the almost mesmerizing drone of the gun or even the subtly commanding way he directs my body. It's him. He's the reason I'm five seconds and one brush over my clit, away from crying out an orgasm. Minutes later, he shuts off the tattoo machine for good and straightens. It's done. Let me wipe it off, and you can take a look. For the next few moments, he cleans my skin and rubs an ointment on me. Okay, you're ready, he says, shocking his gloves. Carefully, I sit up, clutching my sweater, keeping my head lowered. I'm shaking now, and there's no way he can't notice it. Maybe because it's been at least a year since I've been with a man. Maybe it's the adrenaline coursing through my veins like a hit of speed. Or maybe it's just the force of this man's too-seeing 
two beautiful predatory gays. In this instant, aching, wet, and so, so hungry. I'm willing to beg him to take me down, possess me, feast on me. I need to get out of here. Look at me, he softly orders. And though it's the last thing I should do, I acquiesce and am trapped by blue flames. You want me to do something about it? I'm not a hypocrite, so there's no need to pretend I don't know what the it to which he's referring. Do I? No. Yes. God, yes. But I'm a newly hired college professor in a small private college where they made me sign a morality clause for God's sake. I can't just have sex in a tattoo shop with a man I've known all of three hours and who's young enough to be my best friend's baby brother. If I had a best friend, semantics. Your choice, Woody, he says, and his use of the nickname isn't an accident. He's reminding me of my decision to own my shit, to take a chance and not give a damn what other people think, to be brave. Yes, I breathe. Yes, what? I want you to do something about it. He rolls closer on the stool, pressing forward so my knees part around his chest. We're almost eye level, and the demand... The lust darkening his gaze steals the breath from my lungs. Do something about what? He insists. I lose a sound in my throat that's half disbelieving chuckle and half groan. You're going to make me say it, aren't you? He doesn't reply but waits, not shifting closer but not backing away from me either. I want you to do something about. I falter but... The thought that the sooner I put it out there, the sooner I'll discover if that mouth is as soft as it looks, purges the words from me. Do something about the orgasm I needed five minutes ago before I lose my mind. The skin over his cheekbones tauten, making them appear sharper. He cups my knees and eases them farther apart, opening me wider. His gaze skates over my chest, lingering on the tank, clinging to my breast, and the clear outline of my nipples under the thin material, before lowering to my denim-covered sex. You're what, aren't you? He asks, his voice a low rumble with a vein of steel threading through it, demanding my honesty. Again. Yes, I breathe, giving it to him. There's no use in lying. If he chose to unzip my jeans and slide a finger inside my panties, he could easily discover the truth. I'm drenched for him. Embarrassingly so. You're going to let me find out for myself. He presses, damn near echoing my thoughts. Are you going to let me pull these jeans off those gorgeous hips and dick tease of an ass? And let me see if that vanilla and whatever the fuck else in on your skin is thicker Sweeter in your pussy? You gonna let me get my tongue wrapped around that sense, Woody? Shock barrels through me. Shock and lust so hot it incinerates every brain cell that controls motor functions. No one has ever spoken to me like that. Shouldn't I be angry? Offended. Anything other than so damn hot and wet, Haynes might need to make fire retardant and water resistant underwear a thing. My mind is numb, but my body isn't experiencing the existential crisis since my lips part and I utter, yes. He stands and thrusts a hand through my hair, gripping the curls and tugging my head back. 